Soccer. The corner kick, heading the ball. The North American Soccer League. Pele, driving down the field past defenders. Soccer is forwards and midfielders, fullbacks, sweepers, and a goalie. But soccer is more than this. It's conditioning, careful ball control, and it's international teamwork. Hi everybody, I'm Wayne Cody, and we're in New York talking with Eddie Fermani, the coach of the North American Soccer League, New York Cosmos. Eddie, you played professional soccer in Europe for many years. Now you're a coach in the United States. How far back does your playing career go? It can go right back to uh, when I was about probably three or four because uh, being of Italian descent, uh, my parents and my relations were all soccer crazy. So uh, every time they came to uh, one of our birthdays, it always happened to be something to do with soccer, a pair of soccer boots, soccer balls. I think there were three brothers and we must have had about 12 balls between three brothers. So my recollection goes back uh, since I was very, very young. Now when you started playing soccer, did you see yourself becoming a professional player? Any young boy that uh, plays soccer and uh, has a fair amount of ability, I think he always looks at himself as a future soccer star. And uh, I think the ambition was always there, especially when uh, I started to get some honors at school and my county and my state and things like that. Then you realize that you probably you have a, a little bit of ability to play soccer. You were a professional player in Europe. Now how does that system work there? Did a team draft you to come and play for them? When I played for the South African schools, uh, my name was passed on to England of all places, which was the Mecca of soccer at that time. And it just happened to be there was two names. One was Stuart Leary and one was Eddie Fermani that was passed on to him. He saw us play, uh, we played a game against Leesburg Park and we beat them about 9-2 or something like this and I happened to get about six goals in that game and my friend who played next to me, Stuart Leary, he scored two and um, I think that uh, the manager of Charlton, uh, Jimmy Seed, must have actually seen the, the, the potential in the two players and that's the way we were invited to go to England. Eddie, how long have you been in professional soccer? Oh, I've been playing professional soccer for about 18 years altogether, I think. Opportunities in soccer for almost everyone. Young athletes can begin playing in local leagues. There are school leagues and amateur area leagues, college, and of course professional leagues. Very little equipment is needed in soccer. You need a ball, of course, open space, and something to mark off the goals. But the skills needed for soccer can always be improved. As a defender, you need to learn not only the skills and strategies of your own position, but you also need to know what skills the forward or striker whom you're playing against will use. You see, studying all positions on the field will help you to be alert to more scoring opportunities for your team. Playing positions. Eddie, let's talk about each of the positions on the field. Now in soccer you have forwards and midfielders, full backs, sweepers, and a goalie. First the forward. What special skill does it take to become a good forward? He has to have speed. If you've got a, a speedy player and uh, he can take defenders on and uh, them so as to get behind them, then uh, a forward needs speed to do that. To have the ability to score goals, to see the opportunity to score goals and take the opportunities. 
when you say a forward or a striker, he has to be in a striking position. He has to be sharp when he's going to be in that striking position. Therefore, you don't ask them to come back and work out in midfield and work in defence. How about the midfield position? Well, I think again it says midfield means between the forwards and the defenders. And therefore, he is the man that helps defend and helps create. So what he's trying to do all the time is when the opposition get the ball, they are trying to take the ball off the opposition and defend and make sure the opposition doesn't attack us too early. And when we get the ball, they are there to distribute the balls to the forwards so that they could score. The fullbacks and the sweepers, Eddie, are the last line of defense in front of the goalie. Now, what special skills do these players need? Defenders have to be able to read the game well. They have to be able to cover one another perfectly because if you don't, somebody can easily push the ball between two players and the forward can go straight through in, onto goal. So they know, how to, they know how to defend correctly, and that means covering, balancing a team, and also they have to be good tacklers and good headers of a ball. But I think you notice that when you're talking about all these positions, you find they all have to be good headers of a ball. They all have to have good technique. Even forwards ought to know how to defend to put themselves into a defending within their area that you're asking them to play. They all have to have peripheral vision. They all have to uh, have speed if possible. They all have to be aggressive. There is no position on the field that you can say once more than something else because every soccer player is a quarterback and he has to read the situation and play to the situation that he sees. So everybody, in fact I call soccer a thinking game because everybody has to think. So you have to concentrate and say, oh, well where's the centre half, or where's my midfield, where's my forward, and where's my right winger, now where should I be? The goalkeeper's job I think is very important to the team, but what should a good keeper do? Uh, you see some goalkeepers, uh, when the forwards shoot, they catch the ball and they drop it slightly and they, then they catch it again. That mustn't happen. Once that ball hits your hands, it must stick in your hands. You must have very good agility. You must be able to uh, go from one end of the goal to the other end of the goal and catch the ball. Uh, you must also be brave. We know that the forwards are concentrating on scoring goals, obviously, and, and your goalkeeper, he's working on defending your own goal. Now, would you say that these are the key positions then on the team? Well, I think everybody's valuable to the team. You know, if you've got a right, uh, uh, bad right back and the opposition know about it, they're going to exploit him as much as they possibly can to, uh, to get their left winger to uh, get past the defender and cause us problems uh, in the middle of the field, in, in near the goal. So everyone's uh, very important. Uh, goalkeeper's important, the defenders are important. The midfield players and the, stri and the strikers and the forwards are important. Therefore, there's no one specific uh, position that you can say is more important. Eddie, what about the young players that are listening to us right now? How do they know what position he or she should play? It's difficult at the very beginning to say when a boy is six or seven or eight or nine or ten or something like that, that uh, uh, this boy is going to be a, a midfield player or he's going to be a forward or he's going to be a defender. Um, these things come later on. You get into a position that you start to play and you begin to like it. I will just give you a bit of ex my experience as, as a young boy. Um, I used to play in midfield position. But then, after a while, my coach, he wanted me to play me in defence. So I went and played as a defender. After a little while, he put me back into midfield. And then one day he was short of a player and he put me up into the forward line. And I enjoyed it so much and I scored goals. And so one can never tell when he's 10 or 9 or 8 where you're going to finish up playing. That comes later on when you get into the bigger team, the older teams where you're going to play. The main thing, the whole team should be for young players. Just go out there, play the positions that the coach asks you to play enjoy it and get as much enjoyment out as you possibly can, then later on you will develop or
some coach who's had experience in soccer will see you playing, you'll say, you will suit my team better in this position. No matter what position you do play, when you step out on the pitch to begin the game, you need to be in condition, ready for two halves of almost non-stop action. Training and practice. Eddie, unlike many coaches, now you actually do the workouts with your team. I remember before the 77 soccer bowl game, you were down on the field warming up with your players. Now, why do you do that? Well, first of all, Wayne, I love this game so much that I still feel as if, uh, uh, you know, I can go out there and play with the boys and uh, enjoy myself. And if I go out there and I can play and I can enjoy myself, these young boys, they must also think the coach can do it. I must do it. Eddie, how do you run a workout with the Cosmos? I always warm the players up. We never allow the players to start training until we've warmed them up, until they've done all their agility, all the exercises. Uh, sometimes the players may think it's a little bit boring, but it must be done. You can't send athletes out into the cold and ask them to perform 100% straight away. So the first thing we do, we warm up nicely, which must take more than half an hour, as far as uh, I'm concerned. Uh, we then go into, uh, if it's a running day, we may give them some running. And if, if we do give them a lot of running, then we don't give them a lot of ball work. Eddie, when you say ball work or ball handling practice, what are you talking about there? It could be uh, various little games uh, with the ball. Uh, could be shooting, could be crossing. It could be situations where we play two players against one, two against two in little small areas, and coach them that way. Uh, we also may play uh, uh, the whole length of the field uh, and we may play also that some the forwards can't come over the halfway line and the defenders can't come over the halfway line therefore it makes you play long balls into uh, your teams so that you've got to play with your heads up so we're trying to devise little games all the time well, what is the key thing to do then for a young athlete when they're getting ready for an actual game get them used to the ball you know, they say fam familiarity breeds contempt, but not in soccer. Familiarity with that little round leather thing, that beautiful round leather ball, that brings you to becoming professional soccer players. You've got to get familiar with that little round ball. And before the game, get them to play with it a little bit. Juggle it, pass it, do anything that you want to do with it, but get them moving around with the ball so that when they come to a game, they know that they have to pass and move, pass and move, pass and move. And that's what the game's all about.
In training and practice, you usually work on individual skills or in small groups. But soccer is a team sport. A goalie can play his or her position better if the defenders each do their job. Midfielders, they have to trust the forwards that they'll be moving toward the best striking positions on the field to receive a pass. And if you play well in the open, but another team member plays well in a crowd, you must know when to pass off and how to get open to receive a pass yourself. Team play. Eddie, assists are very important in the game of soccer. Scoring a goal is probably number one, but then making assists would be number two. Now you sometimes see a player bring the ball down the field and he might have a scoring chance, but instead he chooses to pass the ball off. He might not be a scoring threat for his team, but it seems that he does contribute. You're talking about uh, my type of player, actually. Uh, I hope that my whole team gets into a situation where if he, if he can score and somebody else is in a better position, that they're going to give him that ball. That's teamwork. And uh, this is something you try to create within the team all the time because you're talking to them, you're telling them that when you're in a certain position, if you aren't absolutely certain you're going to score and somebody else is certain, you pass him the ball. Because if you don't, the next time he gets into a position and you're in a better position, he won't pass you the ball. So therefore, something that you have to get into your players that they have to work for one another, play for one another, and give the scoring chances to the person who has the best scoring chance on the field. Now, if you have the ball and suddenly you find yourself, say, in a crowd of two or three defenders all around you, should you usually try to get rid of the ball as soon as possible to a teammate, or maybe should you try to fight your way out of that crowd? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult if they're going to try and fight their way out of it. Why not use the other two players that are free to go and attack them somewhere else where they are going to now be deficient of two players. So the thing is what you're trying to do, you're trying to create situations on the field where you have a superior number of players. So therefore if I've got a player and I've got three players around me and I've got the ball, it's best to distribute the ball somewhere where they are going to be deficient of players so that we can we can hit them quickly and try and get behind their defense. We are not going to try and go through where they have four and five players. We are trying to go through a position where may, they may be have one or two players so we can get behind them and score goals. Eddie, is there any best way to set up a throw in from the sidelines when your team has the ball? The best thing you can do, Wayne, is to get the ball as quick as you possibly can and then you'll always find somebody that's free because the opposition probably tends just to leave you for a second or two. The best thing is when the ball goes in, get it as quick as you can, then you'll find out you'll always have somebody free to throw the ball to. I think the best thing really when you're playing, if someone is marking you, is to take him away a little bit and then come back to the key, to the thrower, and then let the thrower throw the ball to you, and then you just play it back to him again. Now what about the positioning when your opponents have the ball for a throw-in? What should you do? Well, I think the main thing is for you to put yourself in the correct defensive position. Even if you're a forward, you still have to come your goal side of the player and make sure that he plays the ball into a direction, even maybe where you want him to play it, although he's got the ball. The thing is that everybody should come into a defensive position. And when I say defensive position, don't think I want everybody to go stand on the uh, penalty box area. Even although you may be near their penalty box, you can still come goal side, your goal side of the man, and you're in a defensive position already. So it doesn't matter that you're in near their goal area. It's to come your goal side of that player, to put yourself in a defensive position so that he doesn't get a free ball and start attacking your midfield players, and then their midfield players start attacking your defenders. 
So they are really defensive play, uh, plays, even for forwards in their area when one of their defenders or a thrower gets the ball. Eddie, is there any time when the other team has the ball that a set defensive play can be used in soccer? The team that has the ball dictates where their men are going to, therefore they dictate where you're going to go. You don't have any set plays for throw-ins unless uh, you start to get near the opposition's goal and then you can have set play. But it is the forwards and the people that have the ball that dictate to you what your defenders are going to do. So if we get the ball and we near their penalty area, it's my team that's going to dictate what we are going to do to them. And then we can set up the set plays. You talk about your kind of player. Now as a coach and even as a player, You've had the opportunity to work with some of the most outstanding soccer players ever, including, of course, Pelé. What was it like working with a man who many say was the greatest player in the world? First of all, I've always admired Pelé. Uh, to me, he's been the greatest player that's ever lived. It was an honor to play against him. When I was playing for Inter Milan in Italy, I played against Pelé, and Santos came to uh, Milan, and we played him. And uh, it was a thrill just to play on the same field as him. Um, we're very pleased because uh, that match we beat him 3-2 and I got our three goals and he got their two goals. So it was another thrill for me. But I heard so much about Pelé and uh, I read so much about him and seen so much about him that um, when I came to coach him, uh, I was very, very pleased and uh, thrilled that uh, I would have the opportunity to be associated with uh, the greatest player in the world. You know. He really is the greatest player. You cannot be a first-class, outstanding player of that caliber without being a great human being. positioning can improve your team's chances of scoring off a corner kick or help you when you're putting up a strong defense against an attacking midfield game. Now whether you're playing soccer on your local team, in the North American Soccer League or even in World Cup competition, the more you learn about the game and its strategies, the more exciting it is to play. individual skills. What about a young girl or boy, say they're extremely strong with their right foot. Now, in training, would you have them concentrate on that right foot and improve a little more? Or would you work on improving maybe their left-footed play? Well, I think there, there's a lot of world-class players and famous players that were only left-sided or right-sided. Uh, it meant that their one side was so strong that uh, they didn't have to use the, the other side as much. But uh, I think it's better if you can become two-footed. And uh, again, if you are just one-sided, you're left-sided, and you find a little bit more difficult control, play with the ball, work with the ball. Then what you've got to do is have certain little drills and only play with your right foot and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. You know, one of the most spectacular plays to watch, I think, is the header. Sometimes you see a player head the ball and it looks like their teeth would rattle. 
Now, just how do you head the ball properly? That ball does not hurt you. It hurts you when you catch it on the, in the wrong place. But when you catch it in the right place, you don't even feel the ball on, on, on your forehead. So it's got to be caught on your forehead with your eyes open. I cannot stress more, Wayne, that your eyes must be open so that you can see the ball because if you can see the ball, that ball will not hit you on the nose or in your eye or, or something like that. Eddie, let's talk for a moment about other sports. Now, should a young player concentrate just on soccer or would you suggest they play other sports? I think it would be a great idea if you could play two or three other sports because uh, the coordination between various sports will help you to uh, better your soccer. And um, if you aren't playing soccer and there are other times of the year when you can play other sport, by all means do it. Eddie, how could a player work on improving his soccer skills when maybe he or she happens to be alone? Many a time you get young boys and they're all on their own and they don't have anyone to play with. You know your best friend? The ball is your best friend and a wall. You can do everything off a wall. Find yourself a nice wall. You can pass with the inside of the foot. You can pass with the instep. You can pass with the outside of the step. You can back heel the ball onto the wall. You can head the ball onto the wall. You can throw the ball onto the wall and you can catch it on your thigh, your chest, your head. You can do everything off a wall, Wayne. And the harder you throw the ball up the, against the wall, the faster it's going to come back off you. So if you want a little bit of speed off the wall, all you've got to do is kick it hard up against the wall or throw it hard up against the wall and it'll come back to you quicker. If you want to take the exercises nice and easy, you throw the ball slow onto the wall, softly onto the wall, and it'll come back slow to you. Eddie, what else can you do besides knocking the ball against a wall? Do little exercises yourself. Even if you put little dustbins in a row and go in and out the dustbins, or you get little stones or something, put them in a row, or anything that gives you something to play at. And do exercises against. You may have a couple of broomsticks or something. I can stick them in the ground and just go and in and out the broomsticks and round the broomsticks and use them as goals. Uh, you can use them, any, any object that you want to use, you can use to teach yourself to play soccer. Eddie, you're very familiar with European soccer. You've played there for years and coached there, but how do you feel about America's future in soccer? Uh, it's absolutely exciting and thrilling uh, to watch the young American uh, boys and girls playing soccer and the standard that they've set. I feel that uh, the standard which has been created in the last 10 years only, really, because since the league and the soccer is getting organized so big in America, that uh, the standard has improved tremendously. And I feel that uh, America has a great future as a soccer nation. I don't think there's any question about that at all. Eddie, thank you. Eddie Fermani, the coach of the New York Cosmos in the North American Soccer League.